Good morning, happy Monday, everyone. Praise God. Once again, he's been faithful and true. And he's blessed us with another day, another opportunity to trust in him and believe that he is God and that he works all things out for our good. So be encouraged this day that the Lord has made and be glad in it because his mercy endureth. We're living in an age of grace. The grace of God is abundant. Be obedient to his word and live worthily before him in righteousness in the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you this morning so thankful for this new day. Another opportunity to trust you and to be led and guided by your spirit unto truth and righteousness. Help us. Help us to walk in a way that pleases you. Being obedient to your word. Seeking your face and understanding your will for our lives this day. Help us to be led by your spirit. Help us to know your will and to do it by the power of your Holy Spirit. We have faith in you, Father, and trust you. Thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, Amen. Amen. So the, this week's lesson is called uh, Christian Calling and Vocation. Your daily devotional is titled Recognize and Commission Leaders. It's from the book of Numbers, chapter 27, verses 12 through 23. <clears throat> it says, and the, and the Lord said unto Moses, Get thee up into this mount, Abram, and see the land which I have given unto the children of Israel. And when thou hast seen it, thou also shalt be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother was gathered. For ye rebelled against my commandment in the desert of Zin, in the strife of the congregation to sanctify me at the water before their eyes. That is the water of Meribah in Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin. And Moses spoke unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thy hand upon him, and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and give, and give him a charge in their sight. And thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, whom shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim, before the Lord. At his word shall they go out, and at his word shall they come in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and he took Joshua and set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation. And he laid his hands upon him and gave him a charge as the Lord commanded 
by the hand of Moses. <clears throat> so Moses was at the end of his life. He would not see the promised land because of disobedience. And so he asked the Lord to appoint another leader to lead his children, his chosen ones. And so God elected Joshua as leader. The people need a leader called by God. The leading of God's people is by his calling. Okay, Christian calling and vocation. The central truth of this lesson is that Christian leaders need continual prayer to remain faithful to their calling. The focus of the lesson is to see value in God-given vocations and be faithful in service. The evangelism emphasis is that prayer for leaders aids the church's evangelistic work. The golden text says, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, which the laying on of hands of the presbytery, and that's from Timothy chapter 4, verses 14. <clears throat> okay, calling and vocation are terms most often associated with individuals who engage in public ministry as a career. We talk about being called to preach, or we say pastoring is their vocation. The two terms are often used interchangeably and defined as a strong urge toward a particular way of life or career. Timothy's having a definite call of God on his life is evident by the mentoring instructions written to him by the Apostle Paul. But we are not to assume supernaturally inspired Christian service is reserved only for vocational ministries. To the contrary, all believers are to consider themselves the called according to God's purpose. And that's in Romans 8.28. <clears throat> Some, however, are called to specific leadership roles. See Ephesians 4.11. And perhaps a greater level of responsibility and accountability is expected of them. See Luke 12, 48. In this study, as we continue to observe Timothy as one called to pastoral leadership, as a father exhorts his son, Paul emphasizes to Timothy the necessary prioritization of prayer and godly living. Our emphasis in this study begins with prayer and ends with an appeal to hold fast to sound doctrine, a combination essential for biblical balance in every generation. The church must never allow prayer to become a formality. Our prayers must always be varied and versatile. Paul offers four important components of an effective prayer life and ministry. Passionate entreaties, and that's um, prayer requests for personal needs. Intercessions, petitions on behalf of others, and giving of thanks. No person and no need should be excluded from our prayers, and we should pray for all people. That's in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. <clears throat> okay, section 1, pray for secular and church leaders. People in authority, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. It says, I exhort, therefore, that, First of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving thanks be made for all men, for kings 
and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Okay, Paul insists prayer is the church's priority. First of all is the phrase he uses to begin this pastoral charge. Thus, before any other instructions are given and before any other ministry is undertaken, Timothy is to call the church to prayer. These directives constitute the kinds of things the church would be expected to intercede about, not only in their public gatherings, but also in their personal and family prayer times. God's church is not a political entity, and its leaders must never permit partisan politics to either guide or to become the church's mission. Although in some cultures the government has taken an adversarial attitude toward organized religion, the church must be careful how it engages any such conflict. Paul's command is to pray for everyone. When he narrows that to kings and for all that are in authority, he leaves us without the option to pray only for those leaders whom we like or with whom we agree. <clears throat> at the time of Paul's writings, uh, at the time of Paul's writing this, Nero was the emperor of Rome. History says Nero murdered his brother, his wife, and his mother because he saw them as a threat to his throne. He killed Christians with fire turning them into human torches and often crucified them upside down. Tradition reports Paul was assassinated by Nero, the possibility of which Paul must surely have been constantly aware. Nevertheless, his pastoral instructions to Timothy was to pray for kings and all who are in positions of higher authority. Some might argue Paul's prayers were in vain because Nero and many other authorities did not change. Yet, to take that position is to miss the point of why Paul's instructed such prayers. He gave three reasons why Christians are to pray for their government officials. Number one, for our own benefit. Offering such prayers motivates us to quiet reflection and peaceable living. living. Number two, whatever anybody else does, we can take it to the Lord in prayer where we find the peace required to live in godliness and honesty. All of us should exercise our legal rights to get involved in the affairs of the community, the state, and the nation. However, becoming people of prayer enables us to temper our reactions to partisan divisions and always maintain a godly demeanor. Number two. It is good and acceptable to God. As believers, we are dual citizens of this world and the world to come. Our foremost desire is to live a life pleasing to God, being good ambassadors of Jesus Christ in a world that, in many ways, is like a foreign land. Many parents, when asked by their child why certain directives were given, 
have responded with, because I said so. Why do we pray for those kings and those in authority? Because God said so. It is good and acceptable to him. Number three, he wants all men to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Our prayers can go where we cannot. There are no borders, no prison walls, no doors that are closed to us when we pray. Who knows what tragedies are averted, what wars are postponed, what atrocities are canceled because a believer prays. And who knows what hearts in the King's Palace or the Congress or the White House are moved by the effectual, fervent petitions of a godly believer. See James 5.16. <clears throat> There's an insert here titled, The Work Before the Work. It says, long ago, a Chinese man became prized and celebrated for making the best, most elaborate and enduring bell strands for temples. He attributed his, his success for doing the work before the work, searching through hundreds of trees to find the ideal tree for his wood carving, taken from inside Job by Stephen W. Smith. In today's study, Paul said very little to Timothy about the day-to-day -day rigors of pastoral life. There was nothing about sermon preparation, visitation, or administration. Instead, he focused on the work before the work, prayer, without which young Timothy would have become overwhelmed and discouraged. Okay, section 1b, Christ, the mediator. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 through 7, which says, For there is one God, and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Verse 5 echoes the voice of Jesus thundering, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's John 14:6. A mediator is a go-between, one who settles disputes. The greatest of all disputes regards the separation of man from God because of sin. Sin breaks our fellowship and communion with God. Paul explains Jesus is the only valid way for us to connect to God. As early as the 3rd century A.D., some of the church began to venerate certain sainted men and women, including the Virgin Mary. In the beginning, this was seen as a polite way of honoring those before them. But over time, the practice of praying to the saints was introduced John Calvin wrote, the church in the beginning <clears throat> tolerated these abuses as a temporary evil, but was after, afterwards unable to remove them, and they became so strong, particularly during the prevailing ignorance of the Middle Ages, that the church ended up legalizing through her decrees that at which 
she did not but wink at first. Calvin rightly concluded such prayers were rooted in Roman pagan superstition and constituted idolatry. The Bible contains no examples in either the Old or to Old or New Testament where believers pray to Mary or to departed saints. None. To the contrary, Jesus told us to ask the Father and my Jesus' name. John 16, 23. We are instructed to pray to our Father in heaven. Matthew 6, 9. To call upon the name of the Lord. Romans 10, 13. And to let our requests be made known unto God. Philippians 4, 6. From a simple point of practicality, why then, if we are privileged to pray directly to the Father through Jesus Christ, who ever lives to make intercession for us, would we need to channel such a prayer through a third party? We do not. And such actions constitute idolatry rather than genuine prayer. We agree at least on this point with the Augsburg Confessions statement. Scripture does not teach calling on the saints or pleading for help from them, for it sets before us Christ alone as mediator, atoning sacrifice, high priest, and intercessor. Jesus alone has purchased the right of mediation on our behalf. Nowhere in Scripture are certain select individuals elevated to sainthood. All sanctified believers are called to be saints. Romans 1 7, Ephesians 2 19. It is only Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all. 1 Timothy 2 6. And only through him do we have access to God. Amen. <clears throat> so Jesus is our uh, mediator, and no human being should be elevated to the level of Christ. We are instructed to pray to the Father in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. We have that right, that privilege, and why would we abandon that to seek out another, whether it's a pastor or a friend? Go to God yourself first and speak to him and share your petitions with others. But first, seek God for yourself. He's waiting to hear from you. He loves you and cares for you and wants a deeper relationship with you where you have the freedom to come to him personally. Don't go the long way around. Come directly to God in the name of his son Jesus. I thank you for your time this morning. I pray your Monday is blessed with abundant gifts from God. Have a wonderful day.